So this talk is going to fall up into two halves. The first half will be um, looking at the case for Shakespeare of Stratford and why I personally um, am somewhat sceptical. And the second half will be looking at the case for Christopher Marlowe. Um, so uh, just before we start, uh, a, a show of hands perhaps. Who's absolutely sure that the works were written by Shakespeare of Stratford? Okay. Um, who's absolutely sure that they weren't? And, and who's somewhere in the middle? Obviously, everyone else. Yes. Good. Um, I don't think this is a, this is this is the place for certainty. My my, my feeling is um, who can be sure? There's no there's no firm evidence for anybody in my view, and it's all circumstantial. But I find it fascinating, and and my job, if I have a job at all, my self-appointed job is just to um, open up the question a little bit more, and I, I really would like it to be taken a bit more seriously in academia, which is obviously where I work um, and uh, I play. Um, and it's not a very popular question in English departments, although I find historians are a bit more open to the idea that history is a story, and the story we have might not necessarily be um, the truth. But what I would say, if, if those, those of you here who firmly believe that the works were by Shakespeare Stratford, it's absolutely fine with me, and just carry on. Honestly, I, I really genuinely am not here to change anybody's mind because I think it, is, it, is, um, it's kind of, it feels like a very important thing and I know people get very, very upset about it and I'm genuinely not here to upset anybody and I absolutely welcome anyone of any belief um, to have a conversation with me and, and I'll leave some time at the end for some questions. But we'll start with this, so why is Shakespeare's authorship doubted? There are a lot of things put forward uh, as, as reasons. Um, and I find most of them inaccurate. But the, the one that often comes up is that it's snobbery. This is a form of snobbery, you must all be snobs, um, because you refuse to believe that a, uh, a Glover's son could write his works of genius. Um, another one is ignorance, you must be ignorant of the period, you don't really understand, grammar school education was perfectly fine. Um, we love conspiracy theories, is the other one, you're a conspiracy theorist, I expect you believe um, that the American government organised 9-11. Uh, this is the latest one. Apparently, we hate Shakespeare. Um, it has been put forward that uh, by Stanley Wells and Paul Evanson, unfortunately, and there came a University Press book, which is a scholarly book, therefore shouldn't really be trying to. Uh, I think it's just an ad hominem attack, which essentially saying that people who are sceptical about Shakespeare hate Shakespeare. We don't hate Shakespeare. We're Shakespeare lovers. Derek Jacobi and Mark Rylance are great Shakespeareans, they're not anti-Shakespeare. Um, what we can agree, probably in this room, I hope, is that we all love the works that go under the name Shakespeare, whoever the author may be. We have this in common, that we are, many of us, great lovers of Shakespeare. Certainly, most sceptics I know are really passionate about the works and get more deeply involved in them as they explore the authorship question. One of the reasons why I really like the ship question is it really engages young people in Shakespeare. They see far more reason to get very involved, read the plays and poems, once they get involved in the idea of this, there's a mystery. There's something there that kind of is more engaging than the rather dull and staged, sort of orthodox uh, version of Shakespeare that, that I was certainly brought up with. Um, so, but no, it isn't about any of those things. And it is, it is about evidence. It's about evidence, it's about the lack of evidence, but it's also about some very peculiar bits of evidence, some of which I will go through tonight. It's pretty hard to cover the, all the ground in a bare hour, but I'll, I'll give you a summary of some of the stuff that really interests me. So what evidence do we actually have about Shakespeare of Stratford? We have more than 70 documents related to him, and they're all of a legal or business nature. So we know that he buys and sells land, he buys and sells grain, he buys and sells tithes, he buys and sells shares, he, bu he brokers a marriage dowry and uh, he lends money at interest. Now, if you were an entirely neutral historian coming to this, here's this guy, his name's Fred Smith. Um, these are all the records we have. Um, if you wanted to form a conclusion about what he did for a living, you would say that he is a businessman. He is a broker. He is particularly a middleman, this buying and selling business. He was, uh, one of the things that happened is he was um, prosecuted for hoarding grain. Now, he was prosecuted for hoarding grain not because he was a grower of grain. He wasn't a farmer. He had bought the grain cheaply, and he was holding on to it until the price went up, because that's what a broker does, that's how they make money. So it was actually a direct evidence, if you like, of his broking, brokerage activities. 
So here he is, the businessman or the broker. We know that he was a shareholder in the theatre. So there is a theatre connection. There are documents linking him to the theatre. I mean, you know, this first document, which is a payment for performances of the Lord Chamberlain's Men in December 1593, it says William Shakespeare, it doesn't say William Shakespeare, it's Stratford. But when you add it into the other things, so 1599, again, the Globe, lease, it says William Shakespeare, it doesn't say William Shakespeare of Stratford. But, uh, and again on 1603 with the Scarlet Cloth that is given to William Shakespeare, one of the King's Men. But we do know. In 1616, on his, will, on his will, he refers to these fellows, uh, Hemmings and Condell, and they are shareholders of the King's Men. Now, this is sometimes used as an argument, meaning they were acting fellows, um, but you can just say they were shareholding fellows. The, I won't go into the evidence for him being an actor, but it's actually small. I mean, most Orthodox scholars think that if he did act, it was very small parts. But so that then links back to all the other stuff, and you say, well, that presumably is Shakespeare of Stratford, because we know the will is Shakespeare of Stratford. Um, but just because you're a shareholder in a theatre company doesn't mean that you wrote plays. Now, his name is on the plays. That's one of the big arguments. His name is on the plays. We know from his will that he was a shareholder. I would say that bit on his will is an interlineation. It was added afterwards, so that is a little interesting thing. Um, <coughs> When was it added and by who? How genuine are some of these documents? We can't always say. But let's just say he was a shareholder and his name is on the place. This is not disputed. Um, in his lifetime, the name William Shakespeare was on 13 different plays, including Pericles, which some people don't want to include in the canon, or perhaps not completely. Um, and after his death, in the period between his death and the first folio, the name appeared for the first time on Romeo and Juliet, which had been published anonymously ever since, I think, 1594, and Othello. Most of the Shakespeare canon was either not published or anonymously published up until the first folio in 1623, so that was a very significant publication. The trouble is that the name William Shakespeare is also on plays and poems that we know he didn't write. So here's a couple of title pages. These are just with the initials WS. But scholars accept that this WS refers to William Shakespeare, that these were put out as if they were by William Shakespeare. Um, this one, George Ells published this in 1607. He published Shakespeare's sonnets two years later in 1609. Um, but these were not written by William Shakespeare. That is the consensus opinion. And nor was the London Prodigal, which says by William Shakespeare or a Yorkshire tragedy that says written, W. Shakespeare. And uh, here's two more. Sir John Oldcastle, it says printed in 1600, it's actually 1619, so actually after his death, was what they call the Pavier false folio, um, but that one was 1602. Um, one of these was written by John Marston. Uh, no, sorry, Michael Drayton, we'll come back to that later. But uh, his testimony. Well, it was a dangerous time to be a writer. Elizabethan England. This is John Stubbs having his hand cut off for writing something that the Queen was very upset about. And many writers were imprisoned, Ben Johnson, Thomas Nash, uh, various others imprisoned, um, punished. You could potentially be tortured. You know, Thomas Kidd, the playwright, was tortured in connection with Marlowe, something that Marlowe is supposed to have written. So there are lots of reasons for wanting to be anonymous. And perhaps, uh, not necessarily just being anonymous, sometimes being anonymous might not have felt quite safe enough. We do have a modern precedent for the use of front. In the 1950s, during the McCarthy era, when writers were being blacklisted for supposedly being communists, we know, for example, that in 1953, the Best Screenplay Oscar for Roman Holiday was awarded to this man, Ian McClellan Hunter, and in fact, it should have been awarded to this man, Dalton Trombo. He was the real writer of Roman Holiday, but he was blacklisted and couldn't work in Hollywood. So he asked Ian McClellan Hunter to be his front. Now, this was only awarded to him. He now officially has the Oscar for the screenplay, but it was very recent. It was only awarded to him after a long, long campaign by his son, 
many years after he had died, and just before his son died, um, the, the um, American Guild of Screenwriters finally uh, got this overturned. Now, if this is in the modern era, where we have plenty of documentation, and we have, you know, uh, typewriters, and, you know, you can copy things, and you've got telephones, and how hard was it to get re-attributed re to the real writer, even in our own lifetimes? Um, it's an example of how difficult it can be once something's been set up as a fact to overturn it, even though there are people alive who know Dawson Trombo was the writer. So, here we have the use of fronts in the 1950s. Is there any possibility that there were fronts in the 1590s? Well, in Farewell to Folly, 1591, Robert Greene writes this. He writes of writers who get some other Batillus to set his name to their verses. Thus is the ass made proud by this underhand brokery, and he that cannot write true English without the aid of clerks of parish churches will need make himself the father of interludes. And interludes is a 16th century word for plays. So Robert Greene's evidence testifies that people use what we would now call a front. They would put some other real person would put their name to something. And he specifically talks about, we don't know who he's referring to here, he seems to have someone specific in mind, perhaps he that cannot write true English without the aid of clerks of parish churches. Well, I want you to look quickly at handwriting. <coughs> Here's Christopher Marlowe's signature. Uh, here is, uh, whose is that? That's John Haywood's. Quite sort of swirly Elizabethan things, aren't they? Where you had to be quite good with the pen in this era if you were going to be a writer, um, because quill pens are quite difficult to handle. Francis Bacon is that one. And that's uh, William Stanley, the sixth Earl of Derby. And that's Gabriel Harvey, very neat. Uh, 1598. And that's William Shakespeare's. And that's William Shakespeare's. It looks slightly different again. And that's William Shakespeare's. It looks different again, doesn't it? Jane Cox of the uh, National Archives, or the Public Records Office as it was then, handwriting expert, has suggested that these are possibly by four different people, four different people, perhaps clerks. I mean, they weren't great at writing, but I guess clerks don't have to be brilliant at it. Um, here's another one. And this last one says, we'll get there, by me, William Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> and it has actually been suggested that by me, William, was written by a scribe, but that the Shakespeare was separate. <coughs> Can you see there's a slight difference in that? <laughs> so these signatures, if they're accepted as his and not as uh, Clark's, uh, nevertheless they don't look like someone that was earning their living by the pen. It does look as if he had a functional level of literacy, if they are his, but they don't have the uh, the qualities that you would expect from a professional writer. Now, it may be, and it has been put forward, these are all from the last few years of his life, perhaps he was very ill, and his hand was very shaky. Well, you'll find that there are a lot of things where kind of excuses have to be made, and I think um, there are too many anomalies in the case for my liking. I would say, you know, I could allow one or two things, but it seems odd that this is all we have of his handwriting. This is all we have. We don't have any scraps of manuscript. We know that when the first folio was produced, the manuscripts must have existed. So it's not that they were burned in the globe fire because that was prior to the first folio's production. So what did happen to all the manuscripts that would have gone into producing the first folio? Where are they? So you can compare these are the signatures of literate men and see that they do fall somewhat short. And it also doesn't go together with this. This is what Hemings and Condell say. His mind and hand went together. And what he thought he uttered with that easiness that we have scarce received from him, a blot in his papers. This is the man who can't even sign his name without a blot. Really, what are these papers? These are not proud papers. These are not, they're actually saying it's very different from the kind of stuff they normally receive from playwrights. It looks like what they were getting <coughs> were fair copies that some professional person had written them out. They weren't actually getting Shakespeare's, well, they weren't getting this Shakespeare's handwriting. <coughs> Let's look at what Ben Jonson has to say. He wrote a little epigram that was published in the year of Shakespeare's death, 1616, and clearly being written prior to that, we don't know exactly when, and it's called On Poet Ape. Now, you can't see that, so I've reproduced the text for you here. Um, you don't need to read all of it, 
but it's about poet ape, someone who is aping a poet, who's pretending to be a poet. And it says, poor poet ape that would be thought our chief, whose works are in the frippery of wit, from brokage is become so bold a thief. As we the robbed leave rage and pity it, at first he made low shifts, would pick and glean by the reversion of old plays. Now grown to a little wealth and credit in the sea, he takes up all, makes each, each man's wit his own. So Poet Abe is someone who has started as a broker, buying up old plays and selling them on, is now buying the plays of, of writers that exist and essentially representing them under his name, as if they're his. And it says the sluggish, gaping auditor devours this. He marks not whose twas first. He's basically saying people just sort of accept that they are by him. And this man is a man who would be thought our chief. In epigrams of the time, people never name their targets. But if you wanted to name someone who would be thought the chief of the playwrights in 1616, you might come up with William Shakespeare. Ben Johnson has a terribly interesting and difficult relationship to the authorship question evidence. This is the document uh, for the granting of arms to William Shakespeare of Stratford, or rather to his father, John. And you'll see up in the top left, it has something crossed out. It says, non saint droit, I don't know how to say it, without right. It says, basically it says, no, comma, without right, which is the herald refusing to grant the arms. But this has been re reproduced without the comma there, where it says not without right. And not without right then becomes, when it is granted three years later, Shakespeare's motto. Now, Ben Jonson, he takes William Shakespeare, this is Shakespeare of Stratford's not without right. In the year that it's granted, in 1599, we have every man out of his humour. And he has a character called Insulso Sogliardo, who pays to have a coat of arms and his motto is, not without mustard. <laughs> and, well, a lot of scholars find this very difficult, and they don't want to think that Ben Jonson is having a go at Shakespeare of Stratford, but it seems fairly right that he is, and some do actually accept that that is what's happening, and they put it down to the war of the theatres and everything. But uh, this is what Carlo Buffoni says, Troth, I commend the herald's wit, he has deciphered him well. A swine without a head, without brain, wit, anything indeed ramping to gentility. That's quite a thing to say about this man if this man is the author of the works of Shakespeare, a man without wit, without a head, without brain. This is why scholars find it hard to believe, but I think the target is Shakespeare of Stratford. So, look at what he does. There's a Ben Jonson in the first folio material. He calls the author soul of the age star of poets. Is he meaning the same man that he, he parodied and said was without wit, without brain, ramping to gentility, mocking his, his motto? Privately, in conversation to William Drummond, he says Shakespeare wanted art. Now, is this a very two-faced man? Or is he talking about two different people? Well, when he says soul of the age and star of poets, he says it in a poem that is headed this, to the memory of my beloved, the author, big capital letters, Mr. William Shakespeare. So is he making a distinction between the author, who goes by the name of William Shakespeare, your know, pen name William Shakespeare, uh, versus Shakespeare of Stratford, who is the one that got the coat of arms? We are told that the first authorship doubt was in the 1850s, Delia Bacon's group theory about Francis Bacon being at the head of a coterie of writers. And that was cer certainly the first open, you know, published Shakespeare scepticism. But the very first authorship doubt I contend is in 1598, the year that the name William Shakespeare first played, uh, appeared on plays. It appeared on a couple of plays, including Richard II. And it's by John Marston and Joseph Hall in their satirical, they have a sort of couple of satirical pamphlets where they answer each other. And the references they're making are to Venus and Adonis and the Rape of Lucrece, which were published a few years earlier, 1593 and 94. It is accepted by some scholars, but not all, because they, they struggle with this whole idea that there was doubt about the authorship, that, I mean, there is a clear reference to lines of Venus and Adonis that are being parodied. Parody. They're being parodied very directly. 
Um, and they refer to this author, the author of Venus and Adonis, as Ladio. They compare him to a cuttlefish who hides himself in a cloud of ink. Joseph Hall says, who list complain of wronged faith and fame, when he may shift it onto another's name. So there's another little bit of evidence that fronts were used. You know, there was a denial that this, is, this has actually occurred, but this has occurred. In that era, people were using the names of other real people to protect their identity. Perhaps they didn't want their hands chopped off. You know. um, Labio is interesting because, and this has been very recently identified by Alexander Waugh, who shared this information with me. Quintus Fabia, Fabius, Fabius Labio is a Roman uh, consul who, at this time, this would have been fairly recently well known amongst educated people, but he was known to have been a poet and he got the African slave Terence to put his name to his plays. So by calling him Labio, they're actually referring to an authorship issue, uh, uh, an issue of misattribution, misrepresentation. Then we look at the work of Diana Price and the evidence that she's come up with on literary paper trials. This is her book, Shakespeare's Unorthodox Biography. She looked at what you might look at if you wanted, if someone was a writer, what evidence would you expect them to leave behind? So, um, <coughs> as opposed to being a businessman. So, on the basis that lots of things get destroyed over 400 years, many things will not survive. Nevertheless, the things that do get through, what kind of categories of evidence might you reasonably expect someone to leave behind them if they'd made their living, their main living, as a writer? So, she looked at these categories of evidence. So evidence of education, letters, especially the literary matter, paid to write, uh, direct relationship with a patron, an original manuscript or even some page of original manuscript, handwritten literary notes, commendatory verses, they were always doing verses for the prefaces of each other's works, miscellaneous personal references referring to the person as a writer, Books owned, borrowed, written in, etc. Notice a death as a writer. And she set a, a limit of within one year of their death that so someone says this great writer has died. So looking at all of these 10 categories, and then she looked at 24 other writers plus Shakespeare. So 25 writers who were well known from that period. And we'll just go very quickly through them. So basically these go green where evidence exists. Uh, and we'll see, so Johnson, who was a fantastic self-publicist, wrote to lots of people, was always writing commendatory verses, um, very, very connected in with other writers. Um, he has left evidence of all ten categories. Uh, Nash, not doing badly, actually, I'll consider. Um, and John Massinger, Gabriel Harvey, Edmund Spencer, Samuel Daniel, George Peel, Michael Drayton. We're going down sort of less and less evidence, basically. Uh, George Chapman, uh, Drummond, William Drummond, Anthony Monday, we've got John Marston, Thomas Middleton, John Lilly, Thomas Hayward, Thomas Lodge, and Robert Green, uh, Decker, so we've got Tom Watson, Christopher Marlowe, Francis Beaumont, John Fletcher, Thomas Kidd, John Webster, William Shakespeare. <laughs> there is no unambiguous personal testimony from his lifetime that would suggest he is a writer, and it is quite extraordinary. This is more than a statistical blip, because more time, money, you know, research money, hours, the scholars have concentrated on his biography in the last 200 years than on all the other writers put together. And new things are still being discovered about the other writers. Some brand new documents in Marlowe's biography were uh, discovered only five years ago. Um, it's not all done with the other writers, but with Shakespeare we're done. There's, there's nothing more to find. And there is no unambiguous personal testimony linking him to the place he's supposed to have written. No one who knew him personally appears to have thought he was a writer or have left any evidence to that effect. And all the references to him, or to William Shakespeare as a writer, are impersonal. They're people who don't know him personally. Um, and you can read her book and you can see the sort of, you know, the detailed breakdown of all the evidence there. So why do we think he's the author? Well, chiefly, two things. The first folio, the prefatory material of the first folio, and the Shakespeare uh, monument the, in Stratford Church. So let's look at Ben Johnson, who was chief organiser of this. He didn't just write the, the big poem. 
but according to some scholars, he arranged all of the material, he got all the prefatory material together. He may have even written Pennings and Condell's bit, apparently. And so if someone has analysed it for little stylistic tweaks that are Johnson's. So essentially, in the first folio, in Ben Johnson's poem, it says, Sweet Swan of Avon. And in Leonard Diggs's, Diggs, Diggs's poem, of the deceased author, master, William Shakespeare, it says, Thy Stratford Monument. So, Avon plus Stratford, Stratford on Avon. It's not the only way of reading the evidence, obviously. There are other Stratfords. There are other River Avons. There is one famously running very close to the Countess of Pembroke's. I know someone told me they would seen them talk about Mary Sidney, Countess of Pembroke, as an authorship candidate. So um, it's not exactly solid, this evidence, and particularly because it's organised by this man, Ben Johnson, who seems to have such strange split opinions about Shakespeare, almost as if he's talking about two different people. But we have to remember, he talks about sweet swan of Avon. I mean, swans are famously mute. <coughs> <coughs> famously mute. And Sogliardo, who you may or may not accept, is his, his having a go at William Shakespeare of Stratford, he introduces him in his play as a kinsman to Justice Silence. Justice Silence, of course, being a Shakespeare character, but silence, mute swans. Maybe he's saying this guy is just very good at keeping quiet, which you would need to be if you were going to be a front in that era. Let's look at the monument. What Leonard Dix actually says is, when time dissolves thy Stratford monument, when time dissolves it, it's not even talking about its permanence. And there is a 16th century uh, meaning of dissolves, which is to resolve or solve. And in fact, if you look at what's on the monument, that uh, interesting poem. Okay, stay passenger, why goest by so fast? Read if thou canst whom envious death has placed within this monument, Shakespeare. Read if thou canst. Well, if you've got to the second line, I'm guessing you can read. So what does read if thou canst mean? Does it not mean read as in solve? Look at the rest of it. With whom quick nature died, whose name doth deck his tomb far more than cost, see all that he has written. What's going on there? Does it not sound a little bit like a cryptic crossword cube going on? There's, there's a very interesting uh, solution to this by Peter Perry, which you can find on the internet. There's lots of people who have had a go at it. But it isn't a straightforward poem. Even Stanley Wells admits it's very cryptic. It's very cryptic. Read if thou canst. You really have to look at, why are you saying, oh, well, I'm, clearly I can read, I've got to line two. But there's something else here as well. Within this, my... Who, whom envious death hath placed within this monument Shakespeare? There's not a, a, a comma there. Is Shakespeare the monument? Whom has death placed within this monument Shakespeare? So there's so many ways of reading stuff, isn't there? This is, I love text. It's great. It's full of puzzles. But here's something else. I was looking at this recently with my friend uh, Peter Perry. And when he was looking at he'd done an article on why what this says. Like this says... In judgment of Pilius, in inspiration of Socrates, in art of Marrow, the earth covers, the people mourn, Olympus holds. Well, Marrow, might not be Marrow, might be Mora, is, is, is the surname of Virgil, so that means the poet Virgil. But why use the form Marrow? Um, and why not use Ovid anyway? Because Ovid was the, was the great poet that Shakespeare loved and took all so many tales from Ovid, so why use Virgil? It seems an odd choice. If you're saying, so the, the judgment of Pilius, Pilius is, is a, a very rare term for Nestor. Why not use Nestor? Why, why, why say Pilius? And in fact, if you're going to have someone to stand up to be uh, typical of judgment, why not say Solomon? Why use Olympus when Parnassus is the heaven that poets are supposed to go to? So you look at this and you think, well, okay, what's going on here? All of those, the beginning of the lines, as you'd expect with a poem in this era, are capitalised, and then all the proper names are capitalised. One reason why you might choose those particular forms of those particular names is because you can rearrange them. Impost. 
It is not only the root of imposter, this is my own personal little thing that I suddenly, it suddenly struck me. I thought, that's quite nice. It's not proof, but I kind of like it, I have to say. Um, so obviously it's the root of imposter, but also impost from that era means a tax, a duty, an imposition, a tribute, specifically a customs duty levelled on merchandise. Bearing in mind the idea of Shakespeare as a broker, that he was trading plays, he's a levy on merchandise. It's one way of reading impost, which is there, you know, it's like why those choices? No Stratfordian scholar has explained why those particular names have been used, and they do seem odd choices when you begin to look at them. So we go back to what we have. He buys and sells this, that, the other. He brokers a marriage. He is clearly a broker. Once involved in theatre, why not buy and sell plays? It makes sense within his profile as, you know, this is what he's good at, this is what he does, this is how he makes money and gets the second biggest house in Stratford. So, does he buy and sell plays? Here we have Ben Johnson says, Poet Ape, who would be thought our chief from brokage, has gone to a thief. So, you could certainly read who would be thought our chief as Shakespeare. I said there's no proof, we're not doing any proof here, but uh, just stuff to consider. Here's the plays that have his name or initials on them that aren't his. So, more possible evidence for him being a broker. Michael Drayton, who I mentioned earlier, is a Warwickshire man. You'd think that Michael Drayton would have an interest in another Warwickshire man who became the most famous playwright of the era. He never wrote about Shakespeare in his lifetime. He wrote about other people, he mentioned other people, but he didn't ever mention him. And then something like 11 years after his death, he, he, he did, how he did, he, you should see how he described it, because it's more than that. He talks about sort of fitting a sock. It, very interesting. Anyway, trafficked with the stage. That's the word he uses. He's trafficked with the stage. And if you look this up in the OED, at this time, it only applies, it still only applies to uh, basically doing deals, trade, trafficking. Okay, I could say, oh, it's a poetic use of it. Of course you can, of course you can. But it's interesting, it just fits in with all the other stuff. Then you have John Ward, who, the Reverend John Ward, who moved to Stratford-upon-Avon uh, in the year when one of Shakespeare's daughters was still alive, and certainly his granddaughter continued to be alive, and he was, he was a Shakespeare fan, he really liked the works, and he was trying to find out information about Shakespeare, he kept a diary. This is the information he managed to get, that Shakespeare supplied the stage with two plays a year. Again, it's a word that is more suitable for merchandise, buying and selling. And buy and sell plays, also poems, because we know that The Passionate Pilgrim, a work that came out as by W. Shakespeare, 1599 and again reprinted in 1612, contained a number of poems, some of which were by Shakespeare, some of which were by people like Christopher Marlowe, Sir Walter Raleigh, uh, Thomas Hayward, who got rather upset about it, and others. So, not averse to having the name on things that don't belong to him. Why does it matter? People get very angry about it. I think, it, you know, it must matter. People wouldn't get so angry about it if it didn't matter. Sometimes people go, yeah, what's, what does it matter? The plays are just the plays, we, can, we have the plays, and that's all that matters. I think justice is important. Even if someone is dead for well, you know, 400 years, um, the real author, if we care about the works, if there's any possibility that we're wrong about who wrote them, then it would be nice to correct the error, even if we're four centuries late. Orthodox scholars don't understand the sonnets. They've written a lot of stuff about the sonnets. But there are so many puzzles in the sonnets. I know there's more than one uh, argument, you know, for a candidate where the sonnets are actually at the centre of it. I think, you know, stop barking up the wrong tree. If we are barking up the wrong tree, and I can't help thinking we are because of the the real dearth of evidence that should be there. I mean, um, Michael Woods, who did the BBC uh, Shakespeare, the Search of Shakespeare series, he's a historian, he described the evidence around Shakespeare as a man-shaped hole. A man-shaped hole. It, you know, you have to ask, why is this evidence not there? That should, you know, it is peculiar, it's a peculiar gap. We expect some gaps after 400 years, but we don't expect a man-shaped hole. We expect some kind of something. Given that the name William Shakespeare was so famous, in his lifetime, 
that so many people did say William Shakespeare was a great writer, you know, all these impersonal references, it seems extraordinary that someone wouldn't have kept, you know, a letter from him or, you know, written down some conversation they had with him about how he wrote Hamlet or writers do hang out together as well. It was a very small, you know, literary England then, literary London in particular was very small, you know, you could get to know everybody who could read and write pretty much and you wouldn't know all the other writers. He doesn't seem to be at all connected in to that community of writers.